thank you very much for um, inviting me to participate in this conference. I'm uh, deeply grateful and um, I've been very inspired by some of the speakers today and uh, also I've been very touched by the wonderful hospitality that's been offered to me. Thank you very much. I think it was um, Kurt Lewin who said there's nothing quite so practical as a good theory. And um, I, that's the way in which I have approached my work in schools over the years, that it's important to think about the theory behind the practice. And what I wanted to share with you today is a theoretical perspective on peace and peace education. Uh, I think it's quite notable that the title of the conference is Peace Building Through Education. And some of you may or may not know that um, Johan Goltung, who is the father of peace studies, who was born um, in 1930 in Norway, came up with um, one of the most uh, long-lasting theories of peace, which is that we have peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peacebuilding. And I hope that uh, in this short presentation, I'll be able to share with you why I think that peacebuilding is actually the most important enterprise that we can be engaged in, in education. Okay. So I was reminded of Goltung uh, by my colleague, uh, Cathy Bickmore, who is from OISI in Toronto in Canada recently when she came and did a presentation at Cambridge. And uh, she summarised her life's work in, to date in um, a, a paper that she shared with us. And this quote in particular really struck me because I think it summarises how I feel about uh, my work. So she said the big question that she is trying to work with is how do and can state schools, public schools, which are prone to reinforcing inequalities and to avoiding dissenting and controversial viewpoints, prepare diverse young people to handle social conflicts as engaged, non-violent, justice-oriented, democratic citizens. And what's key for me in that quote is um, the reality that schools do re reinforce social inequalities. We, we know that. Um, according to numerous studies, uh, schools are actually um, more segregated than the rest of um, society. And um, also, the only thing that really makes a difference in terms of your outcome at age 18 is the socioeconomic status of your parents. And uh, there are many, in including Professor Michael Apple from, from the USA, who argue that schools are actually engines of social injustice. They perpetuate inequalities. And um, however you, you think about schools, I think it's, it's important to recognise that schools may well be part of the problem as well as being part of the solution. And we shouldn't um, think lightly about uh, some of the challenges that that, that faces for us. Okay, so if we're thinking about peacekeeping, peacemaking and peace building, we can also think about the three important areas of school life, curriculum and pedagogy, relationships, and the way that schools are structured. And uh, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on each of those elements. If we're thinking of engaging in ongoing research, and it's certainly um, my intention to continue to research these areas, the big, the big question that stays with us is what curriculum, pedagogies, relationships and structural organisation in educational settings constitute effective peacekeeping, peacemaking and peace building? And what's the impact of this on peace for individuals and communities at local, national and global levels? So, if we're thinking about peacekeeping, how does that translate into educational settings? Well, Goltung talked about peacekeeping as being about negative peace. 
It's about keeping conflictual parties apart so that um, violence doesn't occur. We all know about peacekeeping in um, international areas of conflict. But in schools, peacekeeping perhaps is characterised by CCTV cameras, by metal detectors, by um, homeschool contracts, by zero tolerance initiatives, the militarisation of schooling, uh, initiatives such as Troops to Teachers and so on, which encourages the ex-military into schools, particularly schools where uh, disadvantaged youth tend to, um, tend to go. Authoritarian behaviour management, do this because I say so. Even behaviourist interventions in which we have rewards and punishments that are teacher-controlled, teacher-mandated, and have nothing to do with the morality or the self-discipline of the individual imposed from the outside. So this is uh, reactive. It's about negative peace. It may well be necessary in, in certain circumstances, but it creates a climate in which we risk the criminalisation of the young and the poor. And a piece of research that I carried out recently into the civic action and learning of young people from socio-economically disadvantaged communities uh, came up with a quote from um, a young person who was talking about police officers coming into school. Can I just say, how, how universal is the talk to the hand um, part of uh, youth culture? Do, do, could you raise your hand if you understand what that means? <laughs> Okay, so it's talk to the hand because the, the ears aren't listening. Okay, so, um, and I hope you can understand me because I'm trying to speak as a 14-year-old um, involved in this study. So she said, today at school, police officers came in and they wanted to talk to me. So I just said, talk to the hand. I just walked away. I go, sorry, I can't talk to you. He goes, why can't you talk to me? I goes, because you're a police officer. I don't like talking to people who've got body armour on and that. I ain't really happy with that. A man has just come up to me with body armour and that. I ain't got a gun. I ain't going to shoot him or nothing. Do you know what I mean? What's he got that on for? It's not right. In the same study, we uh, found that um, in certain communities, young people are only allowed into the local shop one teenager at a time that uh, a local initiative to get more police officers into the local community resulted in young people being issued with slips for antisocial behaviour, for things like um, running whilst wearing a hoodie, congregating with people who were known to be in trouble with the law, walking around as part of a large group. One young man told me that he was given an antisocial behaviour slip for sitting on his dad's wall whilst waiting for him to come home. Now, my daughter is very forgetful. She often uh, f forgets her key. Nobody gives her an antisocial behaviour slip if she's sitting on the doorstep waiting for me to get home. Um, likewise, in Cambridge, our undergraduates, when they want to celebrate, they congregate in large groups. They sit around. They have a few bottles of wine and a barbecue. They certainly don't get told to get moved on. So we're facing here an issue of criminalisation which creates a culture which criminalises poverty. These young people um, are not actively engaged civ civically, but it's hardly surprising because every day they get messages from their school, from their community, which tells them that they are failed citizens in need of protection from each other and um, from the school. Okay, so... Peacemaking, then. So, Goltong spoke about this as positive peace. So, this is reactive. This is when a conflict has already occurred. And we all know the many benefits of peer mediation, restorative justice, and anti bullying initiatives. My own doctoral research showed that peer mediation can have a huge impact on uh, children's experience of bullying in the playground. Restorative justice, we know from large randomised controlled trials from criminologists, is the single most effective way of diverting young people from crime. Being forced to meet with your victim and face the consequences of your action, for some young people, is the first time that they realise that they are a human being who has an impact in the world. And it's, it's a very powerful way of diverting young people from, from crime. 
programs such as anger management, circle of friends, counselling, all of these initiatives are highly effective. Peace building is the most challenging, particularly in a school's context, given um, some of the um, ideas that I was sharing earlier. Peace building has to involve pro-social skills development. So this is about developing the social and emotional aspects of learning. Peace circles, for example, teaching young people communication skills, cooperation skills, how to work with a partner, how to work as part of a small group, how to work as part of a large community. These are all skills that need to be recognised when they're happening. They can be taught across the curriculum, but we need to be conscious that we're supporting young people to develop these pro-social skills. It's not enough just to stamp out antisocial behaviour. We need to work with young people to develop those skills. Adults in our schools need um, to work together and to model the practice. Peace circles, how many staff meetings involve uh, adults talking about the challenges they face, their emotional life, the conflicts that they, they're currently uh, going through. How do staff cooperate together to support each other? Public spaces and events in school which celebrate achievement, inclusion and diversity and a balanced curriculum. So looking at peace uh, building in more depth, a curriculum and pedagogy for peace building would involve history and social studies that focus on the reality of mainly peaceful and respectful human relations in families, villages, communities and international exchange. Women, children, men, 90% of the time, most areas of the world are peaceful and engaged in peaceful trade, peaceful relating. And yet you wouldn't believe that if you were to look at the history books. Lifelong learning and well-being, uh, human development, not accountability and high stakes testing. Uh, models of schooling which focus on high stakes testing and uh, commodification and marketization of education have failed. There aren't enough jobs for graduates. It's not the case that if you have a, co a college degree, you will automatically have a certain kind of lifestyle. We don't even know whether our um, old models of capitalism and growth are going to continue. It may well be that we have to reimagine what the good life looks like. Education, perhaps, needs to return to an education of the whole person as one of the most treasured and valuable experiences that anyone can engage in. Active learning in cooperative contexts, not teaching from the front, not uh, chalk and talk, but enabling young people to cooperate in many different con contexts in order to gain learning. So the key markers of curriculum and pedagogy would be choice, freedom, support, community involvement, participation, engagement, health, flexible groupings, time for reflection. To, to be even more radical, how about we have universal education to the age of 12 and thereafter each young person assigned to a learning mentor and an enhanced um, system of education that enables learners of all ages to learn together. Uh, learning in the community, learning from elders, we perhaps need to dare to dream differently when we think about education. Relationships for peace building, peace circles, as I've said. Child-centred collaborative discipline, not teacher-centred or directive. We say that in education we want to build self-discipline. But unless we give young people opportunities to make mistakes and to see wrongdoing as something that they can make amends for, and conflicts as something which they themselves can solve, we're actually denying them of opportunities to develop as moral human beings. We're doing their work for them. Adult-imposed solutions are never going to work. We need young people to be able to take greater responsibility for conflict resolution, not just in order to create more peaceful schools, but in order to give them the skills that they can take out into their communities. Strong links with the community, including opportunities for apprenticeship, learning from elders and international linking. 
I've been very influenced by the work of Lav and um, Wenger, who talk about communities of practice. They say that learning isn't something which you can capture. You can't teach young people certain skills, which they then bank and then use later in life. Learning is always situational. Young people learn from what they see happening all around them all the time, and that will carry out into the community. Apprenticeship as a model of education is one that's an old tradition of young people being um, uh, educated within a community for their future, future roles. It's a way of a holistic education that doesn't separate out the individual from their community, uh, from different age groups, and that doesn't split subjects into various atomized lessons. It's a more holistic way of thinking about learning. Okay, so finally, school structure and organization for peace building. Flexible, vertical grouping for teaching and learning. Why shouldn't an 80-year-old learn alongside an 8-year-old? Uh, in my daughter's school, when she goes in in the morning, they have vertical tutor groups. So there's two children from every year in secondary school. So they get to offer each other mentoring and support in their tutor groups. Enhanced uh, ICT and learning in other spaces, learning in public libraries, art galleries, local businesses and uh, charities. Why can't young people learn maths in um, a car um, garage, in a catering outlet? Why does it have to be in a classroom? Individualised mentoring and support, especially for strugg struggling teachers and vulnerable youth. It's very, very lonely being a teacher. In fact, uh, I think in the UK I heard a statistic fairly recently that said that 50% uh, of people who we train to be teachers have left the profession within three years. That's a terrible statistic, a huge wastage. What is it about hitting the classroom that makes teachers so very disillusioned and unhappy? How can we support them in the emotional practice of teaching? so that they're able to stay and, and support our young people. Um, I'm going to move on quickly because I need to finish. Um, opportunities for creative freedom and career development for excellent teachers, trust in the profession. The politicians have hijacked, um, apologies to politicians here in the room, have, um, I'm, I'm thinking now of the way in which um, Politicians have made promises to voters on the strength of reforming the education system. We, we now have had 30 years of people from, in the UK, from Thatcher, uh, from Reagan onwards, of people saying they're going to reform the education system. Isn't it reformed yet? Can we stop now, please? Can we, can we get back to trusting the teaching profession with local communities to um, think about what's in the best interests of our children? Local accountability and support. School is a hub with porous walls and regular events and uh, displays. This has been a very brief walk through some of the uh, so, so, some ideas for what peace building might actually look like in schools. Uh, I look forward to discussing it more later over questions, hopefully. <laughs>